Then at the end of the show, when they fight, it's hero besting heavy. Just as its title suggests, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is a fairy tale. Quentin Tarantino's love letter to 1960s Los Angeles takes one of the most horrific events in its history, the murders of actress Sharon Tate and others by followers of Charles Manson, and transposes it to the realm of Hollywood myth, where good guys always triumph. In Tarantino's version of the night of August 8, 1969, it's the Manson family members who meet their violent ends, as brutal justice is doled out by Tate's neighbor, aging cowboy star Rick Dalton, and his loyal stunt double Cliff Booth. Is everybody okay? Well, the f***ing hippies aren't. That, that's for goddamn sure. Sharon Tate is saved, and in the end, they all live happily ever after. Jay, honey, is everything all right? Everything's okay now, honey. Tarantino has played fast and loose with history before, offering similarly revisionist, cathartic retributions in Django Unchained and Inglorious Bastards. In Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Tarantino once again gives us the Hollywood ending that only movies can provide. But does the director have more on his mind this time than simple wish fulfillment or revenge fantasies? I don't know if cinema can change history. I think it can influence history. What influence is he hoping to achieve by turning one of the most gruesome crimes in American history into the stuff of movie adventure? Here is our take on Once Upon a Time in Hollywood's wild ending and how its fantasy gets at some essential truths about the stories we tell ourselves. What's the story? I haven't finished it yet. I didn't ask for the whole story. What's the idea of the story? This video is brought to you by MUBI, a curated streaming service showing exceptional films from around the globe. It's like your own personal film festival streaming anytime, anywhere. You are real, right? I'm as real as a donut, mother by setting his film in the Hollywood of 1969, loading it with references to real movies and TV shows, and including portrayals of some actual stars of the day, Tarantino creates the expectation that we're witnessing a historical recreation. I'm in the movie. I'm Sharon Tate. Making Margot Robbie's Sharon Tate a main character leads us to believe we know exactly where this story is going. Well, so when Tarantino pleaded with the audience at its Cannes Film Festival premiere not to spoil the ending, it seemed like a strange request. The Manson murders have been explored across scores of books, documentaries, movies, and TV shows for over 50 years. What was there to spoil? Tarantino uses our knowledge of the crime to build tension, hewing closely to many of the infamous details of the murders as he strings us along. Charlie's gonna dig you. Manson really did visit Tate's home looking for its former owner, music producer Terry Melcher. Oh yeah, hey man, I'm looking for Terry. I'm a friend of Terry's and uh, Dennis Wilson's. The Manson family really did live on the old Spawn movie ranch, with its elderly, nearly blind owner, George Spawn. Characters we see there like Squeaky Fromey, who later tried to assassinate President Gerald Ford. Squeaky sent me to bed. Would that be the little redhead out front? are based on actual Manson family members. And on the night of August 8th, 1969, a group of Manson's followers, Tex Watson, Susie Atkins, and Patricia Katie Krenwinkel, really did pull up to 10050 Cielo Drive with the intention to murder everyone inside, targeting a group that included Tate, her ex-lover, Jay Sebring, Folger's coffee heiress, Abigail Folger, and aspiring writer, Wojciech Frykowski. What did Charlie say? He said, Go to Terry's old house and kill everybody in there. He said, make it witchy. But fact collides abruptly with fantasy the moment the group encounters Rick Dalton, who, in Tarantino's story, lives next door to Tate. Angered by their intrusion, Bunch of goddamn hippies. Rick confronts the group, inadvertently changing the course of history by redirecting their ire toward him. Hold it! Was that Rick Dalton? In this version, it's Rick's house they break into, where they come face to face with Cliff. Uh, can I help you? And even as they say the same infamous lines the Manson family uttered before murdering Tate and her friends, I'm the devil, and I'm here to do the devil's business. This time, the outcome isn't what they, or the audience, is expecting. No, I was dumber than that. Long before this fateful encounter, the film has already been blurring the line separating fiction and reality. Rick and Cliff aren't real. They're Tarantino inventions, 
although they bear an authentic resemblance to Hollywood stars of the time. According to Tarantino, Rick Dalton is an amalgam of actors like Steve McQueen, Was it true you almost got the McQueen part in The Great Escape? Ty Harden, Ed Burns, Pete Duell, and Ralph Meeker, former cowboys who, like Rick, were forced to adapt to the changing times when the era of tough guys was giving way to a new generation of films steeped in psychological drama and moral ambiguity. It's official, old buddy. Well, it has been. Cliff's symbiotic relationship with Rick is at least partially modeled after Burt Reynolds and his stuntman, Hal Needham. Is that uh, how you describe your job, Cliff? What, carrying his load? Yeah, it's about right. And the film adds another layer of subtext by casting Leonardo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt, two real-life leading men at a similar crossroads. When I asked Quentin how he wanted us to play two aging movie guys who were on their way out, he said, just be yourselves. Tarantino also toys with the fiction reality continuum by casting actors who really were part of Hollywood in 1969, like Kurt Russell, who pulls double duty as the film's narrator. That's a big f lie. Burt Reynolds himself was cast as George Spawn, but died during production. Instead, the role went to Bruce Dern, another veteran of classic TV westerns who similarly struggled with the leap to movie stardom. Would you call that the matter? These actors and the memories they stir subtly underscore the idea that all movies, even the very one you're watching, are just artifice. A TCH? Yeah, yeah. Malibu Puerco Cannon or some shit, I don't know. Tarantino expands on this idea by removing evidence of the cameras and crew during long sequences of Rick acting in the TV show Lancer, obscuring the line between his own fictional world and the one inside it. <laughs> I ain't gonna hurt her. I just want her to play the fiddle. Line? He lets us know we can never be sure where reality ends and fantasy begins, an uncertainty that directly feeds into the ending. I think we've, uh, we reached the end of the trail, Cliff. Metaphorically speaking, Tarantino's film is about the clash between old Hollywood and new Hollywood. Rick, the fading TV cowboy, comes face to face with the next big thing, hotshot director and Tate's husband, Roman Polanski. Here I am, flat on my ass, and who, who, who I got living next door to me? The director of Rosemary's baby, that's who. But in Tarantino's version, old Hollywood fights back against obsolescence. And in the end, it's the ways of old Hollywood that save the day. The stuntman does all the work, while the movie star gets the big hero shot and all the accolades. As his reward, the gates are finally opened up to Rick, and he's symbolically welcomed into the future. Rick, would you like to come up to the house for a drink and meet my other friends? Throughout the film, Tarantino stages this confrontation between old-fashioned tough guys and the encroaching counterculture as a classic Western showdown, a standoff between cowboys and hippies. You're the blind one! Tarantino even juxtaposes Cliff's visit to Spawn Ranch with Rick's day of shooting on Lancer, where the director dresses Rick in long hair and hippie clothes, implicitly linking his Western villain to Manson himself. I mean, nothing anachronistic, but... Where does 1869 and 1969 meet? You want him to look like a hippie? <laughs> well, think less hippie, more <coughs> Hell's Angel. More than a half century on, hippies and the Manson family seem as distant now as cowboys were to the 1960s. They've entered the realm of myth, which allows Tarantino to treat them as such. Cliff is another near mythical figure, a real life white hat. We're told he's a war hero, and we see him as a cool and cocky gunslinger type, riding free across the valley. In real life, he's everything that Rick pretends to be. The whole thing of their career is Rick is the one who pretends to be the badass cowboy, the guy who can do this and the guy who can do that, and Cliff is the guy who's the badass, who can do this and can do that. Cliff can even hold his own against Bruce Lee in his prime, a portrayal that was not without its controversy. My hands are registered as lethal weapons. But again here, Tarantino is playing with myth, using it not only to underline Cliff's formidable fighting skills, but also to announce that he fully intends to rewrite history to suit whatever story he's telling. If I say Cliff could beat Bruce Lee up, he's a fictional character, then he could beat Bruce Lee up. Cliff's trip to Spawn Ranch pits this white hat hero against the black hat hippies. So he used to make westerns at the ranch back in the old timey days. Well, 
If by the old timey days you mean television eight years ago, yeah. And their symbolic culture clash plays out through familiar Western tropes. In a classic Western showdown, Cliff even gets revenge on Manson family member Clem Grogan, who in real life murdered stuntman Donald Shorty Shea. By naming his film Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Tarantino puts it in direct conversation with movies like Once Upon a Time in America and especially Once Upon a Time in the West, both from Italian director Sergio Leone. Released in 1968, Once Upon a Time in the West similarly remixed and subverted Western movie myths, even casting an aging cowboy hero, Henry Fonda, as the villain, much like Rick Dalton at this stage of his career. Yeah, of course. I'm, I'm, I'm the heavy. Rick Dalton is initially reluctant to take part in these so-called spaghetti westerns, but he eventually realizes that they're the exact kind of movies that allowed guys like him to reinvent themselves. Down goes your career as a leading man. Or do you go to Rome and star in westerns and win f***ing fights? Here, Tarantino casts Rick Dalton in his own spaghetti western, one that allows Rick to win the fight and rewrite his own story and Hollywood history. Sergio Leone once called his films fairy tales for grown ups, legends that allowed myth to invade everyday life. It's a formula that Tarantino has followed across the whole of his filmography. I love the operatic quality of it. I like the larger than life, the, the, the vague surrealism. The first book I ever read about spaghetti westerns was called Spaghetti Westerns, the opera of violence. And um, I think I've been trying to do the opera of violence my entire career. <laughs> If you think about the idea that, say, all my movies are one movie, then I think this would be the big climax. Tarantino has described Once Upon a Time in Hollywood as probably his most personal film. He told Esquire, I think of it like my memory piece. This is me, this is the year that formed me. In 1969, the director was six years old and living in Los Angeles, and the film is filled with homages to his formative years, the actual movies he watched, and the movie stars that were living all around him, existing just on the other side of his reality. We see this world through his own eyes. My stepfather drove a Carmen Ghia, uh, like uh, Cliff's character drives, and even that whole shot where you see Cliff driving by those signs, I'm like, well, that's pretty much my view, looking up at my stepfather in the Carmen Ghia as he drove around uh, Los Angeles. Tarantino is showing us where his own fairy tales come from. The film is full of not-so-subtle nods to Tarantino's past work, prominently featuring several actors who have worked with him before. So Tarantino implicitly ties his character's fears about the future of Hollywood to his own filmmaking career, which he suggested may be drawing to an end. He's not the best anymore. In fact, far from it, and he's coming to terms with what it's like to be slightly more, slightly more useless each day. This self-reflection becomes even more explicit in the film's commentaries on movie violence versus real-world violence, a subject that's dogged Tarantino since he first started making movies. The reason I don't want to talk about it is I've said everything I have to say about it. If anyone cares what I have to say about it, they can Google me and they can look for 20 years what I have to say about it. I haven't changed my, eye, my, cho my, my opinion one iota. Tarantino has expressed time and time again that he does not believe movie violence and real life violence are connected. I love that stuff, you know, the killing. A lot of killing. The sinister hippies of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood seem to share the same attitudes as Tarantino's critics. Their decision to go after Rick Dalton is even motivated by blaming the movies for instigating actual violence. We kill the people who taught us to kill. I mean, where the f are we, man? We are in f Hollywood, man. The people an entire generation grew up watching kill people live here. Ironically, it's movie violence that vanquishes real life violence with Rick even turning one of his old war movie props against them. And if anyone still wants to know Tarantino's thoughts on the matter, this seems to be his final statement. By roasting the Manson family in a scene right out of one of Rick's movies, Anybody order fried sauerkraut? he's explicitly using the power of film to right a historical wrong, just as another of his fairy tales, Inglorious Bastards, has the Nazis meet their fiery end in the cinema, the movie screen looking down on them like a wrathful god. That you are all going to die. Flash out! In this case, the wrong Tarantino's undoing is a murder that many people believe changed everything. You can say, oh, I'm using the power of cinema to 
right wrongs or whatever yeah. that. I mean, I think the, the sentence I would use is metaphorically saving Sharon. To understand why Tarantino chose the real-life tragedy of Sharon Tate as the subject of this revisionist fairy tale, it helps to look at how the film, and history, view Tate as a symbol. While the movie takes pains to show Tate as a real person going about her day, living the life that was denied her soon after these moments, we also don't hear from her much or really get to know her. Sharon is more of a presence, an angel of pure peace and love. Diametrically opposed to the soured, evil hippies of the Manson family. Quentin said it to me early on, she's the heartbeat of the story, and for me, I, I just saw her as a ray of light. These inverses represent the positive and negative aspects of the 60s free love spirit. Manson's hippies take what Tate gives, hitching rides while she offers them. I'm only going as far as West Village. Hey, beggars can't be choosers exploiting a near stranger's hospitality while she opens her house to a rotating group of friends and acquaintances. These agents of darkness are framed as the other side of the coin to Sharon's lightness, as the flip side to 60s freedom and openness was dangerous vulnerability to the unknown and the manipulation of lost or mentally ill young people by false prophets like Manson. As the writer Joan Didion noted in her famed essay, The White Album, many people felt like the 60s ended abruptly on August 9, 1969, ended at the exact moment when word of the murders on Cielo Drive traveled like brush fire through the community. It was the end of the party, a bracing rejoinder to the aura of free love, innocence, and endless possibility that had defined the decade. By metaphorically saving Sharon Tate, Tarantino also saves this era of America and asks what might have happened if the party had never stopped. I see it as a rage against a loss of innocence. As Joan Didion wrote in the very first sentence of the White Album, we tell ourselves stories in order to live. We attempt to draw connections and derive meaning from the most senseless events, just so we can keep going, even when we know there's no real meaning to be found. And once upon a time in Hollywood, Tarantino tries to make sense of a tragedy that remains inconceivable. I think we're fascinated by it because at the end of the day, it almost seems unfathomable. And frankly, the more you learn about it and the more information you get and the more concrete it gets, it doesn't make it any clearer. And he does it by telling us a story, the kind of reassuring fantasy we recognize from decades of watching movies. It's a story that allows not only Sharon Tate to live, but us as well. This fairy tale ending isn't quite the cathartic triumph it first seems to be, though. After the violence is over, we're left with a melancholic reflection on what could have been. As Tarantino explained to Deadline, when it was just an idea in my head for a story I was writing, it was like, great, she saved, done. But in the movie, it was like, okay, she saved, dot, dot, dot. Because no, she's not. It's that ellipsis where you have to realize she's not saved. Things did not happen this way. So ultimately, Tarantino's Hollywood ending shows us the real-life limits of our fairy tales. When the lights come back up, we are kicked out of the dream and back into grim reality, here on the other side of the gates. That was the best acting I've ever seen in my whole life. This video is brought to you by Mubi, a streaming service we love. Every day, Mubi premieres a new film. Whether it's a movie you've been dying to see or one you've never heard of before, there is always something new to discover. So in this world where it's very easy to spend hours debating what you should watch, Mubi is like having a really cool friend with amazing taste in movies, making it so much easier for you. They feature hard-to-come-by masterpieces, indie festival darlings, influential art house and foreign films, lesser known films by your favorite famous directors, and more. Plus, you can even download the films to watch offline, and there are no ads, ever. Right now, Mubi is celebrating one of Quentin Tarantino's favorite directors, Takeshi Kitano. Beginning his career as a television host and comedian, Kitano has surprisingly emerged as one of Japan's most renowned filmmakers. Mubi's series Takeshi Kitano, Destroy All Yakuza, highlights the director's best gangster films. We can't recommend Mubi highly enough. You can try it out now for free for a whole month. Just click the link in the description below.